This man made 200 plus million just by following the trend. His name is Jerry Parker, and at 25 years old, he was given a million to trade with as part of the turtle traders experiment. He became the most successful turtle trader ever. Here are five quick takeaways directly from him. Now to give a bit of backstory, the turtle traders experiment was originally backed by Richard Dennis. He had a famous trend following strategy that he wanted to prove that he could teach to other traders and for them to be successful as well. And Jerry Parker was one of those lucky that were to be picked. Uh, he did submit uh, for the kind of job application through a newspaper. He was originally an accountant. Uh, and this obviously this decision has completely changed his life to where now he is one of the most successful uh, trend following traders and has amassed the wealth of over 200 plus million. Now, number one is the fewer optimizations and parameters, the better. Uh, and looking at, um, in once again, this one entry, one exit and a stop loss, you know, I think it's just gonna stay out of a lot of trouble. The fewer optimizations you have, the fewer parameters, um, you're not trying to fine tune things too much, but just have a sort of a crude way of staying in these trends. And my gosh, I mean, the last six months have just been so amazing. We finally all got uh, reminded as to what, you know, what really makes trend following. What makes it is these markets, they just take off, they go crazy. And your job is just not to screw it up. And, um, oh, first of all, do the trade. Most important thing ever is buy those breakouts. So this is a great clip and I pretty much agree with everything he said. Now, primarily because he's a trend follower, trend followers often have a low win rate because they'll have a lot of small uh, losses and then they'll have one winner that makes back for you know 10 plus losses etc um, and that's just the nature of trend following in actuality it's quite cyclical meaning you're going to have times of range bound markets nothing really breaking out and then you'll have some sort of inflection point which then allows the market to break out and do a trend now obviously you can take advantage of both trends short and long um, primarily most trend followers are sort of long traders uh, but you can do both and you're more robust if you can do both short and long as a trend follower. Now, the main points of this is he's mainly just saying, keep it simple. Keep it to where you're just using one entry, one exit. Now, I wouldn't say this is always agreeable because if you do have big position sizes, you really can't just have one entry. Uh, most of the time, you'll want to do some sort of pyramiding to build up that position, but obviously that, that depends on, on how much size you're trading. However, the logic behind this is so true. All of my best algo strategies that I've ever run myself and ever found have always been more simplistic, and those have been the ones that have actually worked on live markets. I did tweet a while ago saying that a lot of complex strategies can feel great for your ego because you feel like you've discovered something that no one else knows about. It's fully, you know, very complex and you have this idea of how it's going to work. And when you try and test it out on live markets, it really never works. Um, so the fewer optimizations you do, the less likely you are to hit overfitting in your back tests and the fewer parameters by, by nature, you're less likely to overfit as well. So meaning more robust strategies and more likely to actually work on the live market. Two is beware of inconsistencies creeping into your strategy. Change, you're supposed to implement these rules and stick with these rules. And the unit size, or what we call unit size, or what people call portfolio weighting, they should be the same as well. These inconsistencies and these things can creep into your trading where you're like, well, I, I size based on correlation. So, and I think this is another way that sort of an inconsistent way of trading can creep into your, your um, systematic approach where you're not treating all the trades the same way. Um, and I think this is something people don't realize sometimes. This is completely true and something I've personally experienced as well, is it's very easy when you have a systematic strategy to then build around um, ideas or logic that you think only apply to these specific scenarios. And that then creates an inconsistency in your actual uh, systematic strategy. By nature of systematic trading, you should be always following your system. Now, I will say Jim Simons obviously has the famous quote of we don't override the models. Um, as throughout the book as well, he has mentioned there's been, I think, two or three times where he has overrided the model. I think primarily one of them was 2008. So I do think there can be logic in place for those extreme events. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a one-off call, but just be aware of the small nuances that you can then put in your systematic trading strategy that could then ultimately um, destroy the principle of that you should be just sticking to a strategy if you're a systematic trader or, or an algorithmic trader. Free is the power and importance of sample size. More rules leads to less sample size, so less confidence you can even have in your win-loss ratio on a back test is you want to have the largest sample size of trades as possible, and by over-parameterizing, you might be reducing that sample size, so therefore those, those returns are fairly spurious. The more important than that, uh, you, you said it perfectly. Yeah, there's nothing, nothing more important than that. I know Neil's um, on his podcast, he used to ask people when he interviewed people, uh, individual traders, what is the one question that uh, 
people should ask you um, about their trading and their system. And uh, in my opinion, that one question is, what's your sample size and how do you count it? And uh, no one ever asked that question. <laughs> but no, that's the most important thing. And in order to get a large sample size, you have to have a you know, one entry, one exit, and a stop loss. It's not gonna get too much better than that. I'm not saying that's not the, that's the only thing you can use. Like I think that um, reducing your positions and reducing your leverage during periods of crisis and uh, to preserve your capital, that's a great rule. It sounds pretty discretionary, but maybe you can come up with a rule for it. And I think you should in order to, when all hell starts breaking loose, like last February, you need a rule. Let's reduce our risk. This is I actually love the initial comments by the interviewer, where he's basically saying the more parameters you have or the tighter those parameter values are, the less sample size you're going to have, which then obviously affects the statistical significance. Now, I've written a thread about this on my Twitter, how one of the most important things in trading is statistical significance, and that is primarily just sample size. You need a large sample size to have statistically significant results for the most part. Let's say as a very crude example, you have you know a thousand percent returns, but your sample size is 10 stocks. That is incredibly likely to be overfit, um, you know, survivorship bias, all those sort of things, simply because you only have 10 samples of that, you know, creating those returns. Whereas if I had said, oh, you know, this is likely to produce, let's say 10% a year at, or 20% a year, and there's 10,000 samples, it just has more evidence behind it to potentially be true and actually live uh, and actually work on the live market. I hands down, I fully love this clip um, just because I've always said, and many other amazing traders have said that sample size is the most important thing, especially when you're building strategies. Um, and this just reinforces that even more. Obviously he's an incredible trader himself. Um, so it's, it's amazing to hear that as well. Four, everything about my personality is wrong when it comes to trading. Parameters and it comes back and it says, yes, you will make a ton of money. These are great systems, but you know, you will have some volatility, you know, for human beings, that's not good enough. We need to have it done our way. And that's why I've never been very interested in creating a systematic approach that fits my personality because everything about my personality is wrong when it comes to trading. I want 1% a month. I want ease, comfort, exactly. and pleasure. <laughs> now, the one part that, that I do need to pay attention to is my personality for risk tolerance. We've talked about that. Uh, I need to get into a situation where my, vol my leverage choices are creating a portfolio that allows me to, to maintain my discipline. But apart from that, everything about trading is counterintuitive and is not something that most humans want to do. Now, initially, when I was listening to this podcast, I was about to disagree because personally, at least in my view, now, obviously, I've only made a fraction of what he has made. So by no means should you take my opinion over his. But when I was initially listening to his podcast, uh, I was quite surprised that he was saying that, you know, everything about his personality is wrong when it comes to trading. So he doesn't really pay attention to it until he then added the caveat of obviously your risk personality. And I think that is very true as well. But overall, uh, I think risk personality is definitely the most important compared to any other uh, personality side of things in trading. Some people really can't handle long-term drawdowns, uh, while others are amazing at handling more risk and are happy to, you know, leverage up even higher and things like that, uh, and are willing to, I guess, take more chances uh, on the probability of risk of ruin or things like that, while others are definitely are not. Um, so risk personality is definitely by far one of the most important uh, things when you are building a strategy or when you're doing, um, you know, position sizing, etc. Now, I also love his other comment on, you know, personality wise, we all just want the, the best and the easiest returns ever, every single month, consistent, no drawdowns, nothing like that. And I definitely have seen that get into the way of traders. Um, I've been very lucky enough to work with a lot of traders on backtesting, automating their particular strategy. And you'll be surprised, a good portion of them will get the initial backtest results um, that are more likely to be um, statistically significant. They go higher sample size, they've done less optimizations, et cetera. Uh, and then they'll, they'll want to push it even more. They'll want to try and you know get it to where the drawdown is below 2% uh, or they'll want to increase the win rate because they don't like uh, having that many losing trades. And in my opinion, I've always given my uh, own uh, lens on it, simply saying that like, the more you go down this route of trying to make it the perfect strategy, the less likely you're going to have something that actually works on live markets. It's going to look amazing on your paper backtest, but it's not actually going to work. The whole purpose of backtesting is to filter out bad ideas and then test good ideas. And you have to do robust testing to then have a good filter over what strategies could potentially work on live markets. Um, and if you're just going through a backtest, trying to get the you know, every single percent return historically, um, it's not going to be the best outcome you actually want to get when you actually turn it on live markets. Now, five is the importance of sticking to a strategy. It's just stuck to our strategy. And where other people were all over the board, you know, trying to figure out how to do this. We were both just doing our thing 
and uh, both had really good success. So I think that's really the the most one of the most important things about trading. Well, I asked Rich one time, what's the most important things about trading? And he said, well, uh, trade small and follow your rules. And I can just definitely say that whenever I've underperformed uh, and not done as well as I should have, and I may be the only one who knows some of those periods, and some of them are fairly obvious though, it's definitely been from one of those two reasons, if not both, trading too large and trade and not being uh, not following my rules. So, I think these two are sort of linked to some extent. Uh, now, obviously, just trading too large can just be too much of a risk profile anyway if you're putting on too much position size. However, it also does link to at least from my personal experience uh, and listening to other traders as well is that. When you have too much size on, you're more likely to break and not stick to a strategy simply because the, your uh, emotions get either the better of you. Um, it's too painful to see yourself going to that much of a drawdown money wise, for example, um, or you're too scared of the eventuality of that drawdown or losses and etc. cetera. Um, so I will say by far, if you have a solid strategy that you have properly back tested, you just need to give it time. Um, I know it can be really frustrating, especially when I've turned on a strategy and it's gone into a drawdown for the first 20 to 30 days. Um, that's incredibly frustrating and incredibly scary to see. But the way I view it is that the drawdown was a controlled drawdown. It wasn't breaking the max drawdown on a Monte Carlo or on a, or on a single backtest. Uh, percentage wise, it was, you know, it didn't seem like the perfect market uh, environment for the particular strategy anyway. So it made sort of logical sense that it was going into a drawdown. Uh, and then after that time, it did actually come out of drawdown and was profitable overall over the coming next months. Um, but that initial time, if I had put on too much size on that initial strategy when I took it live, 100%, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say that I would be better enough to logically think through that process. I would have just said, I'm losing too much money, cut off the strategy, turn it off. I, I don't want to touch it ever again. Um, and that can be very true if you're messing with too much position size and you're not able to stick to a strategy. Now, if you find this content valuable and want more every single week, be sure to follow me on Twitter at Ghost of Trades or be sure to subscribe. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.